Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Ellen Ray Cachola bringing you the first video in a series of videos entitled Philippine X Diaspora Decolonization Process. Today we are featuring Catherine Achacoso, a PhD student in the Department of American Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Catherine hails from Toronto, Canada, but she has roots and family from Surigao, Mindanao. So without further ado, Catherine Achacoso. Cool. So I first want to thank you, Ellen, for bringing us all together and continuing this ongoing conversation on decolonization and settler activism. I feel like it's, at least in a Toronto context, a fairly recent conversation, in part because of our histories of immigration, but also um, largely because we haven't necessarily developed um, the relationship that we perhaps should in, um, with other Indigenous groups, but as well as uh, Filipino groups in the diaspora. So hopefully this will kind of be a preliminary um, overview of what settler activism looks like in Toronto, but also a call for us to continue to be in conversation with one another. Definitely. Um, you know, as, as the years go on, and also with other people in Hawaii and in, in Guam and elsewhere, wherever <laughs> it might be. So, so, with that being said, the title of my presentation today is Critical Settler Orientations, Future Directions in Philippine X um, slash at settler activism in Turtle Island. And what I'm going to be talking about is really two things. So the first part will be about why settler colonialism is important for us as Filipinos living on um, unceded, occupied lands in Toronto, thinking critically about settler activism in a Turtle Island context, um, and the, the importance of place. Um, in this first part, I really want to emphasize um, an analytic that I was introduced to in queer studies by a professor here at UH Manoa, Cindy Franklin, who told me that I should think about settler colonialism as an orientation. Um, and so I'll get really, I'll unpack with my diagram what that might mean and kind of talk about why that's useful for us as people of the diaspora are constantly moving through um, different dis places where indigenous people are being dispossessed. And then the second part of my presentation will specifically address the relationship between the Philippines and Canada in relation to what um, Western scholars have called resource extraction. I want to talk about the implications of that term, um, but also really bring together how the Philippines and Canada can be in conversation with one another, especially because in the Philippines, where my family comes from in Surigao, um, we have many different mines that are being run by Canadian corporations, um, who I argue are working simultaneously with different um, settler apparatuses that are being used in Canada as well on indigenous lands. And so I want to talk about the importance of bringing to light those issues, but also um, not using them as kind of like a, a crux for saying that we are, that we're dealing with equivalent issues, right? So really bringing to light uh, what it means to kind of engage in those issues with place space specificity. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, uh, because I like stories and because I'm, I'm filled with stories right now. I'm going to begin my presentation with a story. Um, and this story is my way about talking about ancestral acknowledgement and uh, my relationship to place in Toronto. So last October, as part of a workshop I organized with the Hemispheric Institute on settler activism, performance studies, and the erotics, I had the opportunity to do a conference. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit a part of Toronto, which is known as Kopitchinok River, or as settlers call it a Humber River. And Kopechinook River is a body of water that I thought I'd known all my life. The water that flowed through Kopechinook River transversed the Great Lakes, where I'd spent many summers with my family camping out in the dunes near the beaches while listening to Makah Sons on the radio. When my family first moved to Toronto, we would spend so, so much of their time um, with other diasporic Filipinos in the Flemington community, just playing in the park and running trails um, and visiting these bodies of water. I'd often wondered um, if they'd had an affinity to these places because it reminded them of the rivers and the oceans that they had back home. Um, in Talisayan and Surigao, where my mother said that she would uh, ride on a banca and kind of toil the kids around Surigao City in an area that's now filled with cement. So to me, when I was looking at the river, I was always thinking about um, diasporic memories of longing and a desire of home, a home that I, as a second generation Philippine ex, had never necessarily intimately known in the way that my parents had known. And so that day when I went to Kapuchinok River, walking down the steps from the old Mills Toronto subway station, thinking of my daily travels around the city, 
I realized listening to First Story Toronto and our guide, uh, Mohawk scholar John Johnson, that I didn't actually really know these waters at all. Um, John talked about, as we were walking down the street, he pointed us to these murals um, over here that you can see on the screen. And he told us that it was called um, Research First Timeline. And he said that it was created by a Shawnee scholar, Philip Cote, who has been at the forefront of a lot of our indigenous resurgence movements um, in Turtle Island. The mural, he said, tells us the story of indigenous cosmologies and of creation stories um, of Turtle Island, but was specifically from an Anishinaabe perspective. He talked about the importance of this in ongoing uh, movements towards urban indigenous resurgence um, that's so quickly forgotten in a place like Toronto that's seen as like the multicultural city um, or the meeting grounds, people often say. And so as we were walking down this, the river, uh, we passed by this sign, right? And it was a, um, a settler narrative about um, York, which was Old York, which was the term that was used to refer to this area at that time period. And so I began to think about a lot of the erasures that happened in this time period. Also the fact that a lot of people, Canadians are not even necessarily aware of that history. And then as we walked even further, um, we kind of began this process of, of trying to reaffirm Indigenous geographies in these places. And so he told us that this river, Kupechinok, um, meant in Anishinaabeg to leave the canoes and to go back to the trails. And so what he told us is that the river connects a lot of um, the lakes that exist in this area. So Lake Ontario, Lake Simcoe, which is a route that connected various Indigenous economies at that time. And many people were for, um, trading different fur trades at that time and also transversing the borders of what we now call the settler states, Canada and the United States. And so in that particular day, um, as I continue to think about the contradictions and my own experience just going to this river and not even necessarily knowing how to address it or how to interact with it or to call it by name, um, I, I began to think about erasures uh, but I also began to think about something that I learned in class, in Noilani Goodyear Ka'opua's class, uh, about the importance of commemorating place and also affirming Indigenous knowledge of places that we transverse. And so in class, she basically told us that um, oftentimes when she goes to other places on, in Turtle Island, she thinks about the importance of honoring um, you know, the Indigenous peoples who care for these land, but also the violences that they've experienced. And so that day for the first time, at least in my, in my lifetime, um, I sat there and tried to, uh, tried to question, you know, what that might look like, what it might look, look like to hold space, to affirm these various sovereignties, but also to even work further and grapple with the significance of place um, in my understanding of what is now known as Canada. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, what I really kind of take from the story and why I wanted to start with the story is because I think when we're thinking about Toronto, at least in a Philippine con Philippinex context, we haven't actually done the work um, to really grapple with what solidarity might look like, what settler solidarity might look like. I think at this point, um, there sometimes is a belief amongst Filipinos that it's enough to decenter whiteness, to question Canada's multicultural context, um, or even some might be some people might say, well, it's just enough to acknowledge that we're trying to reconcile those relationships. But I think at this point, for Filipinx activists, it's really important to question what it might mean to engage beyond resistance, what it might mean to actually refuse the settler state by imagining what it might mean to center indigenous sovereignties, indigenous nations at the center of our community organizing and scholarship. And so by this, I mean critically taking into the point what it, might engage, what it might mean to engage in indigenous cultural projects, political projects around nationhood, sovereignty, and resurgence, um, instead of thinking about how we are going to engage and refuse the settler state alone. I think that both of these political projects are important, but I think that, that I also want to think critically about how we can think about different forms of liberation or different forms of sovereignty that aren't necessarily reliant on the settler state. And so here, uh, perhaps this sounds a little bit like anarchism, um, but I think at this point, at least engaging in these questions um, to interweave our struggles, to, to think critically against homonationalism, think critically against homophobia, anti-blackness, deportation, militarization, and gendered violence, we can think about how we can thread these multiple forms of liberation. And I think a lot of imaginative power can happen when we shift our frameworks towards these um, critical perspectives.
-hmm. And nice. so um, this brings me to the question of why settler, right? So there's, <laughs> um, there's a lot of debate, I think, around this term um, and, if, and its applicability to the Filipino community and how it might be useful in terms of activism. And one of the main critiques um, that I've heard recently is that uh, settler active that um, settler colonialism negates um, our own histories of struggle, our own histories of resistance against capitalism and white supremacy and colonialism, and that it um, conflates us into the category of white supremacist, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think while settler the, the settler indigenous binary that some uh, which is the term some people might call it might be um, seen in that way uh, what settler colonialism really does is allow us to center and to acknowledge the differences with indigenous critiques of colonialism and capitalism and so I really want to highlight um, what that looks like in the Turtle Island context um, here's my point indigenous critiques of <laughs> capitalism do not equate transnational diasporic critiques of capitalism. And so I want to um, really gesture to Leanne Sim, who talks about um, what anti-capitalist critiques look like from an indigenous perspective. And she writes, um, this is in response to Naomi Klein on extraction. Um, she says that extraction and assimilation go together. Colonialism and capitalism are based on extracting and assimilating. My land is seen as a resource. My relatives in the plant and animal worlds are seen as resources. My cultures and knowledge is a resource. My body is a resource. I apologize, Ellen, I can't see the screen. Oh, okay, no um, my body is a resource and my children are a resource because they are the potential to grow, maintain, and uphold the extraction. Assimilation system, the act of extraction, removes all of the relationships that give whatever is being extracted meaning. Extraction is taking. Actually, extracting is stealing. It is taking without consent, without thought, care, or even knowledge of the impacts that extraction has on other livings, living things in that environment. That's always been a part of colonialism and conquest. Colonialism has always extracted the indigenous, extraction of indigenous knowledge, indigenous women, indigenous people. And so for me, the reason why I'm quoting extensively from Simpson's work, uh, first is to, uh, to acknowledge the, the really the importance of um, indigenous critiques of anti-capitalism, but also to show us that there is a difference with how we are, how, what, what we are envisioning as the future and what we are actually critiquing. So when Simpson says here, extraction removes all the relationships that give whatever is being extracted, uh, me, being, give, so taking away their meaning, she's actually saying that extraction um, is, is destroying indigenous knowledge systems, is destroying relationships, is destroying deeply embedded forms of land and creation. And these epistemologies, I think, are really important because these aren't necessarily things that we're using as signifiers in the Filipino diaspora. And so when we're saying, um, until we use the framework of settler colonialism, we have to acknowledge too that indigenous liberations um, are also set, centered around these issues as well, things that aren't necessarily a part of a diasporic Philippine ex perspective. And so if our liberations are tied, we too need to acknowledge the sovereignty of these words, but also the centrality of that sovereignty to our own forms of liberation. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to get us continuing to think about our responsibility um, to these critiques and engaging in these um, indigenous scholarships that are centered in, in our specific places. So in this context in Turtle Island where um, Leanne Simpson is from. And so to think about this more critically, another thing that I wanna talk about um, is this diagram that I put together. And it's around this idea of settler as orientation and action. Um, and so when I created this diagram, I was thinking about this idea of like, what does it mean for us to, to use settler other than um, an identity, which is often what people say, right, when they're talking about settler colonialism, that um, it's used as a signifier to, um, I think, an article once said to give brownie points um, to us to signal that we are allies of indigenous communities. And I feel like this is uh, a really problematic, but it's also a very dangerous perspective on how we might, on why we are engaging in settler activism. And so I wanted to provide some kind of frameworks about what it might mean to think of settler as orientation. And so when we think about orientation, right, we're thinking about um, direction, right? And it, from a Euro-American perspective, that direction sometimes is signaled through this idea of the Northeast, the Southwest, right? 
Um, but in reality, um, when we're thinking about orientations of people of the diaspora, our directionalities can look very different. Um, and so if we're thinking about settler as an orientation, we can think about it through five different ways, right? So first we can think of it as navigation. So as people who are constantly being displaced, especially uh, moving to places like Toronto, like Hawaii, like Guam, uh, we can think of it as navigation, as in navigating through a structure, right? So thinking about our, the differences between um, our histories of liberation, as I was previously talking about, and indigenous, um, ongoing indigenous articulations of liberation. And then two, at the same time, we can center our, uh, the idea of place and space within these contexts. So an example of this would be like navigating through Capitanok River, right? So from a diaspora Philippine ex perspective, at least from my, pers from my experience, um, when I go to Capitanok River, I don't even call it Capitanok River, right? If people would call it like the Humber River. And there's all, for, for me, a lot of times like water comes with this idea of like home, this, uh, this desire for homecomings, right? And so rather than only seeing that particular place through diasporic lens, using orientation as a navigation, um, to, to think about the centrality of place with indigenous critiques and really affirming the sovereignty of that. Mm -hmm. um, next, we can think about Philippine X settler as an orientation or settler, the settler as an orientation through relationships. So who are we forming relationships with? Where are we going? How are we forming these relationships? On whose terms? And when are we willing to be refused? So I think what's really interesting about how um, I've seen settler use in a Hawaii context is that sometimes it can be used to refuse us. And as, as settlers who do not have ancestral ties to this land, I think that we must, as much as we are building connections, we also must be willing to be refused and to acknowledge that we are not, sometimes you don't necessarily have to be in conversations that don't involve you specifically or do not involve your group specifically. And I think that this too is a way of affirming the sovereignty of these, of indigenous groups um, and their right to self-determination. And when we, when we center settler in our analysis, we can um, really acknowledge the importance of this refusal, right? As not only uh, the verbal, but also like the embodied um, experience of being settler. Um, another way we can think about settler as orientation is through movement, right? So I recently read this article by Jeff Corntassel, and he was talking about how sometimes settler gives off the wrong impression that things are already settled, that we have already um, come to terms with the settler state and that it will always be in existence. And settler should actually be the opposite of that. Settler should always should signify movement, mm -hmm. um, that we're going, that we're working towards something, that we're working towards deconstructing something, towards building something, to mm -hmm. um, towards connecting. Um, and I think that settler as orientation can provide that. And then also, I think settler, the fourth thing is about settler as orientation is that it can be a political project, right? So I think in queer studies, people often use this idea of orientation, which at its core is about kind of reorientating to a new future, right? Um, or kind of queering the now, right? And striving for something else um, by disassembling, by critiquing, by uh, problematizing what currently exists. And I think when we use settler as an orientation, which is connected to a political project, we remind ourselves that um, our very presence on occupied lands is political. And so we need to continue to um, mobilize that as a reminder um, to not only support indigenous resurgences, indigenous sovereignty, decolonization movements, demilitarization movements, but to really take action um, is also kind of part of that. And then the fifth thing is that it's future orientated. I think um, Settler reminds us that at the end of the day, we're not advocating for just disassembling um, capitalism and colonialism um, and address and dismantling white supremacy that at the end of the day we're working towards a different future mm -hmm. and that future um, when we are in occupied lands is an indigenous centered future and so for me I want to I, when I'm using the term settler I'm always uh, reminding myself 
um, about the importance of learning what that might mean and also engaging in what that might mean for me as someone living on those lands and um, potentially not having the opportunity to go back home. So these are all kinds mm -hmm. of uh, things that I'm thinking about at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so very briefly, since I think that I've been taking up a lot of time talking about settlers, um, I want to talk about the relationship between Canada and the Philippines in relation to extraction or um, land resources. And Canada and the Philippines, um, while, may, while they may not necessarily have the same um, colonial histories as um, Canada, uh, the United States and the Philippines, um, there are there are many different intersections that exist in terms of our policies, and one of them being around mining. And so what people don't actually know is that, I'll, I'm gonna read you some of the facts here um, before moving on, because I think it's important, that Canada is a major investor in industry. So last year, uh, sorry, in 2012, they spent about $58.6 billion in foreign investments in Canadian mining in Africa, in the Philippines, in Latin America, and on Turtle Island. Um, last, in 2012, also exploration expenditures in Canada were at least 16% of um, a lot of the investments that were made by the Canadian government um, with, to invest in urban, to invest in many minerals and metals. And so it is a big part of the economy. And there's a lot, um, of course, what comes with mining is that there's a lot of conflict with um, around resource extraction, but also with, with indigenous communities. And so um, if I had more time, I would extensively explain this. Um, so I'm gonna go very quickly through this project and then hopefully I can signal to you other points we could, that you could, um, other references that you might want to go to. So in Canada, um, a lot of times the, the conflict between indigenous communities around mining has been really around ideas of policy uh, around problems of po policy, especially treaties. And so in Algonquin territories, um, there is an activist, Robert Lovelance, who was arrested by the Canadian government for protesting against uh, building a mine for uranium. Um, and at that time period, there were a lot of policies that were, um, that were basically being corrupted by the government around ideas of what is the treaty right. There was a lot of confusion around whether Algonquins um, should be given the rights to territories and they couldn't necessarily identify what these title claims mean. And there was a lot of colonial amnesia about Algonquin sovereignty and their right to these lands. And so basically this led to the arrest in order to build, to not only build the mine, but also to displace many, uh, many Algonquin First Nations peoples within that area. And at that time period, uh, a lot of Indigenous scholars were talking about this, not only in relation to policy, but in relation to the ongoing um, colonization of Indigenous lands in Turtle Island. And so how this relates to the Philippines is that in Surigao, especially, well, in Mindanao especially, we see that these histories or these ongoing problems of mining and militarization also persist on Lumad land as well. And so I want to be very clear about this, that um, the way that I interpret this situation in Mindanao is that Philippine X are not Lumad, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, Philippine X, the way I see it is that it is, it can, it can be often, it's often used in the diaspora, but it's often still tied to national identities. Um, and so I really want to differentiate that and center the importance of how Mamanwa or how Lumads are centering um, their rights to self-determination on their land. And in Mindanao, a lot of the mining complex, while not always on indigenous land, are often on indigenous land and it's often surrounding problems around ancestral domains. So in Canada, if the problem is around treaty rights, around title rights um, that give indigenous people rights to self-determination, in the Philippines, it's around this idea of ancestral domains. And ancestral domains, occupy, uh, they operate on really colonial discourses that um, really force indigenous peoples to basically perform their authenticity. And so there are things within the policy that state that they must be there time immemorial and must be practicing certain cultural practices to prove, to prove, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. the important part, to prove that this is their ancestral land. And then from that, even if they are given ancestral domains, oftentimes what happens is that these acknowledgements are not upheld and Canadian mm -hmm. corporations 
um, especially in Surigao context, have been given the rights to build large-scale mines on Lumad land and then have been enforced by the Philippine government through very brute force of militarization. Under um, martial law, we see this precarity rising even more so and um, a lot of the resistance amongst Mamanawa tribes have often led towards death, such as those of Nico Delamente, which happened um, earlier this year, I think in January 2017. And so um, I know it, knowing that these these things are occurring uh, what we can do at least what i'm trying to do um in my own scholarship on north american mining in the philippines is thinking about how these settler states are actually operating simultaneously with, with one another with the philippine government right because when we're thinking about mining it's evident both in a canadian context and a philippine context that some of it has some of it is tied to policies so policies around land titles which are controlled by states and then the re then it's also tied to capital uh, around capitalist structures of canadian empire right canadian empire wanting um different resource extraction projects around the world and so i think that these these two different um examples lead they offer us opportunities to think about our responsibilities to numerous of these places. And then bringing us back to this idea of orientation, it reminds us that um, the national framework that we're using or the transnational framework that we're using um, may not necessarily be the most productive way to think about our relationships to place. Mm -hmm. um, because if in Philippine context, if Philippine X is not equal LUMAD, then also when we are talking about our relationships to places in the philippines we need to center uh indigenous critiques toward indigenous indigenous desires for self-determination indigenous mm -hmm. rights for self-determination and so um the orientation i think for me allows you to move within these spaces right and acknowledge um our responsibilities to these multiple forms of sovereignty and to kind of move to, to move in this way that isn't necessarily um talking about equivalencies um and so hopefully um mm -hmm. i think that th this is something that we're, we're going to have to continue to grapple with um as as we continue to work towards our settler activism but it's something that is important to signify now um and so i want to i, I know that that was um slightly a little bit rushed ellen i'm so no worried sorry no worries. About that. but um the reason why I want to bring these two geographies together is because I think that it is a way for us to think critically about our relationship to Indigenous groups in, in multiple ways that are productive um, but also necessary at this time period. I think mm -hmm. that in Canada, um, because we are so tied to these issues on multiple scales, um, it requires us to look at things in different ways. So versus in a Hawaii context where um, we can read the history of militarization in relation to uh, the Philippine state and the occupied um, Hawaiian kingdom, in Canada, there needs to be an attentiveness to these multiple forms of indigenous nationhood that, that actually refuse Canadian settler colonialism, but also refuse the idea of the Philippine state being the ultimate arbitrator for liberation and sovereignty movements of indigenous peoples back home. Mm. Um, and so, again, I think that the, the orientation does allow for those kinds of complexities and um, hopefully brings up new conversations of where we might move forward. 